All right, let's turn to the text today. Uh, Psalms 40 is where we're going to spend our time uh, for our preaching and teaching on this Sunday. I certainly was uh, brought to this scripture while I was dealing with some of the uh, ministry that is often required of so many of us, uh, we who are dealing with the front line struggles of the, the realities of this very difficult world we're living in. Uh, if you're a teacher, if you are a man, a, a frontline worker in any regard, if you are someone who um, has to provide uh, very up close and, and personal contact to individuals in their moments of need, or even if you're just working in a real toxic environment, uh, how many of you know all of it, it can add up and it can feel quite overwhelming. Uh, while I was in Buffalo last week, I was uh, finding myself falling into some despair and just looking at the conditions of our people. And this scripture spoke to me. It's usually uh, a scripture that we use during our time of, of Advent. Um, it is uh, unleashed uh, through uh, the, the, the time when John the Baptist is usually kind of crying out in the in the, in the wilderness you know, while he's out there baptizing people. And uh, he's, he's declaring, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And, and we are always being invited to make room for God to visit us, to come and, and hang out and be with us. Uh, but the first part of this passage of scripture really speaks to me, and I'm hoping it will speak to us, uh, because the reality is uh, our country, our world is overrun with violence. It's overrun with domination. It's overrun with lots of pain and lots of greed and lots of, 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 of wicked individuals who have the ability to inflict harm on people they don't even know. Uh, their inaction or their action can often create such harm and it often for many of us who are either victims of that harm or many of us who are you know kind of watching the harm happen but feel powerless um, it can particularly if we are constantly being reminded that God is sovereign and God is in control any of you ever ask a question well God why are you allowing all these things to happen if you are in control Anybody ever ask that question? It's okay, I ask it all the time, so y'all can ask it too, I mean, if, if that helps you. Uh, I, I want you to know that God is not someone who is threatened by our questions, our inquiry, or even our doubts, that God is at home in your doubts. God is at home in your fears. God is at home in your anger. Uh, how many of you know God is more at home with those parts of us than we are? Uh-huh, uh-huh. I want you to know that there is not a moment in your life where God is not at home with you. And so in this sense, I think these words of Scripture are even more powerful and poignant for us because God is giving a certain kind of command, a certain kind of invitation, a certain kind of mandate to all of us who are aware that trouble is present, that trouble is near, that trouble seems to be unending, and yet this is what the scriptures say uh, in Isaiah chapter number 40. Verse number one, it simply says, comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak softly and tenderly to Jerusalem, but also make it very clear that she has served her sentence, that her sin is taken care of. It is forgiven that she's been punished enough and more than enough, and now it's over and done with. Verse number uh, three says, there's a voice that cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God, and every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low, the uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain, then the glory. Somebody say, then the glory. Then the glory shall be revealed. And all the people, somebody say all the people. All the people shall see it together. Somebody say together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. 
This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. We're going we're gonna to talk for a few moments simply from the topic, comfort my people. Comfort my people. Let us pray. God, we want to say thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide your words in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please allow your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest on me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. Somebody holler, I need some comfort today. Say that, I need some comfort today. Now, you know, one of the, the most enduring realities of our current moment is that um, we are constantly uh, aware of the, 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 uh, the, 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 the way that, that violence, the way that racism, the way that sexism, the way that, that otherism in all of its many forms are constantly visiting we as a people. I was reading a poll uh, that happened, uh, that was put out right after the Buffalo shooting and it said that 84 to 86% of black folks in America believe that racism, gun violence, and police brutality are major threats to our livelihood. It went on to say that uh, 82% cited the criminal justice system, 76% the cost of health care, 73% restrictions on voting rights, 72% lack of economic opportunity, 71% uh, concerned about drug addiction and abuse. 61% said the lack of access to education is a ma major threat and have said the same about pollution and climate change. That we are a people who are constantly aware of threats. Threats that are external to us and threats and, and concerns that are often internal to us. There was another kind of survey that was taken about the, the, the way in which the direction of our country across race, across gender, across political uh, uh, orientation, the, the direction of our country, 70 something percent agree that we are moving in the wrong direction. And what is so important and fascinating to me about uh, these numbers is that they, they unearth, they make concrete the kind of pressure that so many of us are constantly trying to navigate. I mean, we've been in a global pandemic for over two years, and I, I was thinking about this uh, several weeks ago of how when the pandemic first started, we thought that it'd be a month or two. We were told, you know, just, just, just buckle down for a month or two. This, this, this virus will just pass on by and we'll get back to our normal lives. And here we are two years later. And we got, we, we still have COVID. We got variations of COVID and now we even got monkeypox. Lord have mercy, amen, showing up in, in Northern California. And it, it, it seems to be a time where you and I are constantly being made aware of threats, of, of challenges. And what is so important about this moment, I believe, is our, our Christian tradition, our practices, they do give us tools to help us navigate through these times. They need not require us to be a people who ignore what's happening, neither are we asked to be gripped by fear and paralysis. But that there are tools, there are practices that you and I can employ to help us come to grips with what is going on. I mean, part of why the moment, this season, this month of, of just highlighting mental health and, and trauma healing is so important because just like you have to do some rehab to strengthen your muscles when they become, become atrophied or when you, when you break your ankle or sprain your wrist, you got to go to some physical therapy to help you get the full range of your, mo of your motion. How many of you know sometimes there are some practices that you and I have to use to help us? remain spiritually, emotionally, and psychologically well. In the midst of all the challenges, 
that are around us. And I'm not the kind of preacher that's going to lie to you and tell you all the challenges are going to pass by tomorrow morning. Amen. I'm not the kind of preacher that's going to tell you if you give me $100, amen, then favor is going to come knocking down your door and you ain't going to never have no more problems, amen, because you'd be like, that's the best $100 I spent in my whole life. But I am here to tell you that no matter what season of life you're in, God will always be there with you. That trouble may come, but guess what? God will always outlast your trouble. That God will outlast your trial. That God will be with you through your season of difficulty. Do I have a witness in here that can say God has been with me through my seasons? Amen. God didn't, didn't take the trouble away, but God outlasted the trouble. How many of you know if God outlasts the trouble and you're with God, guess who else is going to outlast your trouble? You ought to pat yourself and say, I, I, I have some staying power. Amen. My troubles may be temporary, but I, with God in my life, I am permanent. And the power of this permanence is so important. Psalms 37 verse 1, uh, I read it while I was fussing with folks at the White House and with the governor's folks in, in, in New York and people in the community. I was reminded of this pastor's scripture. It says, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Neither be envious against the workers of iniquity. Why? For they will soon be cut down like the grass. Uh, any, any ever uh, mowed your lawn, amen, amen, any y'all know, amen, I know we in California ain't a lot of lawns to be mowed, praise God. You know, I was in Buffalo and I was in Oklahoma City, different places over the last couple weeks, they have nice big lawns. I know they have some lawns here, depending on where you live in the Bay Area, but in my neighborhood, we didn't have no lawns. And I thank God for that, because of my friends who lived in L.A., that was part of their chore. You had to get out there and mow the lawn, and then you had to put all these leaves on a, on a bag and, and stuff the leaves all day. And all we had to do was pick a few little green green weeds out of my mom's little, you know, little plant yard. And that, that, was, a, that, whoo, that was enough for me, amen. A little dirt in my fingernails, a little, little callus on my knees. That's all I needed. I don't want to have to mow no lawn. But, but I, I see pictures of mowing lawns. So I say, man, I've seen some pictures of, of, of how easy dry grass can be cut down if you have the right instrument. I'm here to tell you that even though the work of iniquity may seem to be abundant in our country and in our community, they ain't nothing but some dry weeds. And God has a lawnmower and God says that fret not yourself because of these wicked individuals because they will be cut down. Amen. And I'm here to tell you that if you have some, 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 some enemies, some antagonists that are continuing to, to eat away at your hope, I want you to remind yourself that God is in the weed cutting business. Amen. God is, is, in, is in the kind of business that knows how to remove certain kinds of, 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 of barriers and obstacles so we can have and be reminded of our permanence. Now, part of the tool that I think the text lifts up that's so important for us, if we are going to have permanence, if we're going to comfort one another, is we must lean in the, the practice of lament. And lament is a spiritual practice. It is a practice that you and I must become very familiar with while we go through our trials. Lamenting is a practice where you, with a spiritual consciousness, you are able to communicate honestly to God your disappointments. You're able to communicate honestly to God your frustrations. You're willing to communicate honestly to God your anger. And I have found over the last several weeks uh, that there are many of us in our religious and Christian uh, spaces who want to suppress our anger and suppress our frustrations and act as if in order to be spiritual, I must ignore the kind of feelings that wicked things evoke in me. But I'm here to tell you, we have a practice called lament. Somebody say lament. And lamenting is an important part of your spiritual life because what it does is kind of like therapy. It keeps you from having to bottle up things that you were never being asked to hide. 
It helps you to have a pathway whereby you can ask God, Lord, I've done all that I know how to do, but yet bad things, unfortunate things, unplanned things keep happening in my life. Anybody ever had that kind of conversation with God? Lord, you know, I prayed and I fasted. Amen. I paid my tithes. I sang in a choir. I fed the, 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 the hungry. I housed the unhoused. Amen. I voted. Praise God. I, I mentored. I tutored. I went to work every day. I ate healthy. I worked out. You know, you got your long. Anybody got a long? That's just mine. Amen. Praise God. Well, I've started to work out. Amen. You know, I'm, you know, got a little... It's working for me. Somebody say amen, right? But, but, but I had a long list of things why I did not expect trouble to visit me the way it has. And God reminded me that lamenting is a part of what it means to have a, a real connection with God that is not grounded in superficiality. Sometimes our faith can be so superficial that it cannot hold the complexity of our lives. And the practice of lament helps you and I almost like a shovel to dig deeper in our faith so we can hold more of God's power and more of God's healing strength and more of God's uh, compassion to assist us along the way. I want you to be someone who is aware that lamenting is a part of your spiritual practice. When you see the shootings happening, it's okay to lament. When you see your child going through pains and struggles, it's okay to lament. When your family is going through transitions, it's okay to lament. When your body is racked with pain, it's okay to lament. Why? Because in the lamenting, you are inviting comfort. Because the thing about the spiritual practice of lamenting, listen, is that God does not put a period on your lament. God always puts a comma or a colon, meaning that there's more to come after this lament. Do I have a witness in here that can say, God, when I cried out to you, you answered me. Lord, I, 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 I hope I'm, I'm hope I'm helping somebody today that your lamenting is an invitation for comfort. Just like you going to therapy is an invitation for healing. Just like you working out at the gym is an invitation for more strength and health. All of these are tools that help you access the thing that you need. And I'm here to tell you today that God is looking for a church and a people who are willing to lament, who are willing to hold on to holy anger and righteous indignation. Why? Because it is in the lament that you direct it to the one who is able to answer with strength and with resolve and dare I even say with resolution. Somebody holler, I need to learn to lament. Say that I need to learn. I need to learn to lament. And then I find this per passage to also be welcoming you and I to be gentle with yourself. Be gentle with yourself. One of the things that I find to be important when trouble visits us, whether uh, uh, Dr. Robinson talked about vicarious trauma. Amen. How many of you know that you can have trauma that directs you, that, that impacts you directly? But then you can also have the trauma that is impacting others, but you are so proximal to it that you begin to carry on some of the effects of that trauma. There, there are three types of trauma that, that, that you know, I, I've learned about and have to use in the course of my ministry and, 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 and public health work. There's acute trauma that results from a single incident. There is chronic trauma that is repeated and prolonged, such as domestic violence or, or, or physical abuse or, or, dare I say, mass shootings. Somebody say amen. Or there is complex trauma that is the exposure to varied and multiple traumatic events, often that are invasive and interpersonal in nature. Acute trauma, chronic trauma, complex trauma, all of these kinds of trauma, they begin to do things to our bodies, our mind, our soul, and our spirit, and it always requires 
some form of treatment, some form of healing. And this is where I find this passage to be so fascinating and interesting, particularly as I have been engaging it over the last week. Because in verse number four or verse number three, the scripture says that we ought to make straight in the desert a highway for our God. I want you to think about what does it mean for you to make a pathway for God, to begin to minister to your trauma. Now listen to these descriptions, and I want you to imagine this is a description of the way trauma is carving out places, hollowing out spaces in your life that God is saying, through your healing work, I'm going to provide you some healing. I'm going to fill up, the scripture says in verse number four, that every valley shall be lifted up. I want you to think of what has happened in your life that has hollowed out some valleys, that has created some valleys in your life that, that, that have, have found themselves unable to be filled. God says, if you create a pathway for me to engage your valleys, God says, I will help lift them up. Every mountain and hill will be made low. Imagine those places in your life where trauma has created enough uh, 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 obstacles and it has accumulated enough where it now feels like an ominous mountain that you can't scale. God is saying, if you give me some space to, to make a pathway to that, God says, I'll bring that mountain of trauma to a low place. Lord, have mercy. The uneven ground, God says, in your life where trauma has caused you to feel like you are uneven and you don't have equilibrium or balance. God says, if you give me a pathway to those places in your life, God says, guess what? I can help you find some level ground. Or in the last one, it says, and the rough places. How many of you know trauma and pain in your life can, can make you a little rough around the edges? Uh, do I have any rough riders in here? Amen. Folk, you a little rough around the edges. You kind of like, you know, I don't want to be so rough. Amen. But you don't know what I've had to endure. God says if you create a pathway to the rough places in your life, God says I will smooth it over and make it plain. I want you to know, child of God, that the comfort that God is extending to us is a comfort that is seeking to help you and I understand that the trauma and the trouble that need not to define the totality of your life. You may go through things, but God says, I'm going to bring you through. And while you're going through, I'm going to smooth over some of these rough places. I'm going to help bring high some of these valleys. I'm going to help bring down some of these mountains and you. Verse number five says, we'll begin to see the glory of the Lord be revealed. Uh, and I want you to know, child of God, that there will be glory after this. Uh, there's going to be some joy after this. It may not come tomorrow uh, and it may not come next week. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that joy and glory is just as real as your trouble and your trauma. Uh, that God is saying that I have, amen, some glory stored up uh, that you may not be fully aware of. Uh, but if you can speak comfort to my people, uh, and if you can speak comfort to yourself, uh, and if you can speak comfort to those who are going through it, uh, uh, the scripture says that all the people, somebody say all the people, uh, all the people shall see it together uh, I want you to know that I may be lamenting today but the lament that I cry today is not because I don't have an expectation uh, that trouble is only temporary. Uh, I know these folks may think they have power in Washington, D.C. Uh, I know they may think they have power at the Capitol building in Sacramento. Uh, I know they may think they have power uh, 
at the boss man's office uh, on a Monday through Friday. Yeah. But I'm here to tell you today yeah, that God is declaring to you and I, yeah, though the lament may bring tears, uh, though the lament may bring sorrow, uh, there is a pathway yeah, that God wants to carve in our lives, uh, a pathway that connects us uh, to the one who can bring down your mountain, uh, to the one who can elevate your valley, uh, to the one who can smooth out your rough place. Uh, and as long as I can stay connected to God, uh, as long as I can stay connected to the healer, uh, as long as I can lean into the practices uh, that bring about my salvation, uh, the God I serve uh, will answer every question. The God I serve uh, will give me every door to walk through. Uh, the God I serve uh, will heal every sick place in my body. Uh, the God I serve uh, will restore my troubled mind. Uh, the God I serve uh, will give me peace uh, in the midst of confusion. Uh, will give me joy uh, in the midst of sorrow. Uh, will give me power uh, in the midst of weakness. Uh, comfort ye. Uh, comfort ye my people uh, and speak comfortly uh, to Jerusalem uh, and tell them your time uh, of suffering uh, it's winding down uh, your time uh, of trial uh, it's winding down uh, your time uh, of tribulation uh, it's coming to an end uh, why uh, because we serve a God uh, who is able uh, to do exceedingly uh, abundantly uh, above all we can ask or think uh, somebody shout hallelujah <laughs> comfort ye my people come on stand to your feet and speak comfortly this image was intentional because comfort that is extended to the people it comes through our proximity and our connection to those who share a similar hope and a similar expectation. Comfort ye my people is God's invitation to us to lean in to the work that requires us to not forsake the faith that has sustained us even in the midst of the questions that nag at us. Verse number nine, it's so powerful. It says, climb a high mountain, O ye in Zion. For you are the proclaimer of good news. Raise your voice. Make it good and loud. Speak loud and clear. Don't be timid. Tell the cities of Judah, look your God. The master comes in power and this master will repay all those who oppose you. And they will reward those who have loved him. Comfort ye my people as we go through these seasons of These seasons of, let me just get this right, the seasons of, of, of acute trauma, chronic trauma, and complex trauma, I'm inviting you to also be a person that is aware that we are called to comfort one another. We're not called to fall into despair and isolation. The trauma is not going to disappear but guess who is going to appear? Comfort, peace, strength and healing. The scripture is not saying that you won't have any trouble, we won't have any trouble. It's not saying that the wickedness of injustice and unfairness and white supremacy and, 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 and structural and system oppression is not saying that those things are going to disappear tomorrow. What it is saying is that you have some tools. We have some tools in the midst of these challenges that can 
afford a pathway for our continued permanence. And I want you to know, child of God, you are more permanent than your trials. Hallelujah. We are more lasting than our troubles because there's a God in us, a God who is eternal, a God who gives us access to healing strategies, healing individuals, sustaining and compassionate communities. So God, I pray today, I pray God for every person under the sound of my voice, both in person and in virtual land, who are seeking, oh God, to navigate through these seasons of trauma, these seasons of pain and inquiry and injustice. God, we don't seek to minimize these things. Lord, in the text, you describe them as valleys and mountains. You're not erasing the reality and the presence of these things. You are rightly naming them. You're calling them out, God. But you also says that every valley you will exalt. Every mountain you will bring low. Every rough place and edge you will smooth out. God, I pray for the mountain of trauma, the valley of trauma, the rough edges of trauma, of injustice, of negation, of violence. God, I pray that you will carry us through these seasons. Lord God, with the practice of lament, may we stay in touch with the feelings, the gamut of emotions that visit us, Lord, when injustice, when wickedness, when terror strikes. May we not erase that part of our humanity that you've given to us that signals that something is wrong. But may we not be, be held hostage to these feelings of anger. May we not be held hostage to these feelings of, of trauma, God. But may we, in these moments, be gentle with ourselves enough, Lord God, to make a pathway for you to engage us right where we are. Bless every person under the sound of my voice, oh God. Lift those hands right where you're standing, oh God. It's me, oh Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my father, it is not my mother, it is not my sister or my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, and I need you, God. I need you, Lord, to be a healer. I need you, Lord, to be a sustainer. I need you, Lord, to be my strength, my peace, my hope. And so, God, have your way today. Move by your spirit today. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Hey Amen. Just give one or two persons a quick elbow or point at them and say, speak comfort this week. Speak comfort. Speak comfort. Speak comfort to we, the people of God, all over, all through, all in our communities. Clap your hands and let's give God a praise today. Hey amen. God bless you, people of the way. We are, amen, so mindful of this season of of, 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 of challenge we're going through. We're mindful of the heaviness of this season. But I do want you to know that uh, we have tools, we have strategies, we have people that can help us bear and, 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 and thrive and, and, and outlast these seasons. And so I want, you, I want to invite you to lean into that, okay? Lean into it. Don't, don't allow the day to day, week to week to be something that defines your struggle, but say, Lord, I know that you're able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all I can ask or think in Jesus name. Next Sunday, amen, I'll be here preaching. We're going to start a season of Pentecost uh, for uh, some weeks. We're going to talk about, amen, what it means to make sense of all of the many ways our communication and lives are literally colliding with one another, amen, and what role does the Spirit have to help us navigate through some of these seasons, amen, so Pentecost Sunday is next Sunday, amen, let's come, let's, let's be ready to receive a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit, let's come, let's be ready to think a little bit together about how we can be translators of the good news of the work of God in the world, so everyone, somebody say everyone, Everyone can hear the good news in a language, in a way they can understand it. We certainly love you with the love of the Lord. Let's pray as we prepare to leave this place. God, we want to thank you for...
all the many ways that you have demonstrated your great love for us. Thank you, God, that you are not a God who abandons us in our trouble. You're also not a God who asks us, Lord God, to ignore our trouble. But right in the midst of all of it, you sit with us. You sojourn with us. At times, Lord God, you remove the threat. And at other times, Lord God, you allow the threat to remain and then go through the trial with us. So, God, as we ask you these big questions of where are you in the midst of evil, Lord God? Where are you in the midst of disappointments? God, I pray that we will feel your presence in a very real way. We speak comfort to every family, comfort to every individual, comfort to every community that is in mourning today. Be with us, oh God, and we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. God bless you. We'll see you next week in Jesus' name.